basis of the gospel or the good news or the glad tidings or the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ were first preached to Abraham. And not only is this the basis of the gospel, as you'll see, but it challenges the very core of so-called mainstream Christian belief. See, in Romans 4, verse 13, we're told, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through law, but through the righteousness of faith. So this promise to Abraham was not to Abraham only, but to his seed. And what we'll see is that Abraham was promised the world. It's an expression that we hear, isn't it, colloquially? They promised the world, and it's an exaggeration generally. It's something to expresses bitter dis disappointment. It might be at work. He promised the world, but delivered nothing. Promises that politicians may make, where they promise almighty things, but fail to deliver. You know, even today, modern science promises so much, doesn't it? To free humanity from want, but a significant number of the world still go to bed hungry every night. They still go to bed without that being fulfilled. And when you look around at the religion, we find that they make promises as well, but they are promises that they fail to carry out. They're promises that will never be fulfilled. Clergymen promise their congregations an abiding place in heaven, but they fail to justify their promise by an appeal to the Bible. You see, because what we'll see tonight is in the promise to Abraham, which is the basis of the gospel, that this is not promised by the Bible. The Bible knows nothing of an immortal soul. It describes life and death, and both are related to things that are eternal, to everlasting life or everlasting death. It teaches that life will be upon the earth only and in the form of a bodily condition the form of a physical resurrection to life eternal and an everlasting inheritance on the earth, as we hope will set forth in what we're going to show. Because what we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 is that death and the grave will ultimately be swallowed up in victory when this corruptible or the body that we have for those who are given eternal life will have put on incorruption and this mortal will have put on immortality. The Bible teaches that death came by man through Adam at the beginning. So the prospect of bodily re resurrection to eternal life has been opened up to those who desire to attain it through Christ. As the Apostle Paul also describes in 1 Corinthians 15. And this physical resurrection is set forward as a pattern of hope for those who desire to seek it. Consider the following, these scriptures. Romans 6 verse 5. We're told that if we're planted in the likeness of his death, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, we're told, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Philippians 3, verse 21. We're told, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. What God has promised every person, as he also promised Abraham, every person who seeks it in faith, is promised this, as was Abraham. He promised Abraham the world, the earth on which we stand. But there were conditions attached to this for Abraham, as there's also conditions attached to us for it today, if we're to receive those promises. You see, Abraham for us was an example of faith. But we need to go back and have a look at who was Abraham. He was a man who was important to the purpose of God, and his faith stands out. There's hundreds of references to Abraham throughout the Bible. And in fact, if you don't understand how Abraham fits into that, you won't be able to understand the Bible. 
of Abraham it said that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God in verse 21 he was fully persuaded that he that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness <coughs> Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed for him, to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So we told that Abraham believed, was strong in faith and gave glory to God and was fully persuaded of that which God had promised him. And because of this example, he, he has provided for us a pattern of acceptable conduct for all who desire eternal life, as his biography is studied, as you read about him in the scriptures, it becomes increasingly evident that it provides a wonderful type of what God requires of those who would be saved. Abraham was called out of Ur. And the account of his life commences with the statement that Abraham received a message from God in his hometown Ur of the Chaldees, calling upon him to remove himself from its godless environment and go into a land that God would show him, as we had read for us in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. Little was known of Ur until about 1922, when the archaeologist Leonard Woolley was commissioned by the British Museum to excavate the site of an ancient city on the banks of the Euphrates. Its ruins had been discovered about a hundred years earlier and time and the desert sands in those areas had hidden the city from the eyes of man so that all that was there was a mound of earth. And as the archaeologists cut through the crust and lay bare what was hidden below, it was obvious that Abraham was no backward, ignorant nomad, but he was a member of a highly civilised and sophisticated community. In its heyday, Ur would have been the centre of culture and learning. Libraries contained thousands of books and covered a wide range of subjects. A history of the city was constructed from the ruins of the past, stretching back to the flood, evidence of which the archaeologist had claimed to discover as he dug deeper into the soil there. Ur had its own royalty and aristocracy, and dominated other neighbouring cities. It was the capital of a theocracy and the headquarters of a worship of the moon goddess. The site of Ur had been a matter of conjecture and debate, but with this, its existence became beyond doubt. And what we're told is that, what we're showing is that the, the story of Abraham can be relied upon because the archaeologists have um, found that found Ur and the Bible has been vindicated once again. But we find that Abraham was brought up in an environment of idolatry and he was himself originally a worshipper of false gods. As we have in Joshua 24, verse 2 to 3, in the words to the nation of um, Israel at that time, where he says, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abram from the other side of the flood and led him throughout the land of Canaan, and so forth. So Abraham was brought up as an idolater in a country far away from where he ended up. But for some reason, God called him. And he said to him, get out of your country and go to a land that I will show thee. Why did, he ex why did he select this man? Well, God obviously saw in Abraham qualities of character that he knew he could mould. In much a similar way as he did to the Apostle Paul, or Saul as he was originally known, many years later, that one who had persecuted the, the, the true Christians in that first century, Paul, a man of high principle who once converted, put his energies into the things of Almighty God. 
And we find that the call of God to Abraham caused him to repudiate the false and idolatrous worship and environment in which he lived and to seek out the truth. And he went with his father, his brother Nahor, his nephew Lot and his wife Sarah and left Ur of the Chaldees, went over the river Euphrates, a distance of about 600 miles and eventually arrived in the town of Haran. See, the places in Abraham's life are significant. They have meaning which helps to illustrate the story as it unfolds. Ur of the Chaldees signifies the light of the Chaldees, and its light and knowledge are synonymous with terms in Scripture. The name signifies that Abraham turned his back on the light or knowledge of the Chaldees. Much the same as God requires believers to turn from the prevailing philosophies and false religious doctrines that are around us today. The Chaldeans were of high reputation in prevailing divinity, as we have in Daniel, but they proclaimed a false and idolatrous worship. And if Abraham was to serve God acceptably, he had to turn his back on these ways. Haran, where they went, likewise is significant. It signifies roads or enlightenment. And in fact, in those days, Haran was the terminus of several caravan routes comprising the crossroads of divergent roads. And it was suitably named as far as the biography of Abraham is concerned, for it proved to be a spiritual crossroads for his life. The family of Tiran had, Tira, sorry, had heard the message of God and they were called to leave Ur and to go into a land that he would reveal. And on arrival at Haran, he partially obeyed, but that wasn't enough. They had reached a certain amount of enlightenment, and the question was, would they continue? There was indecision that marked their progress here. Faith and courage was required to go further. Haran was an outpost of Babylonia, and to move over the Euphrates River into the land of Canaan, as commanded by God, meant that he had to leave all those things of Ur behind. He had to go into a land, the land of Canaan, where there was a people who repudiated the worship of God. And for a while they stayed there. We don't have many details of what occurred in that place, but there was obviously some resistance. And once again, Abram, or Abraham as he was later called, heard the voice of God as we have in Genesis 12, verse 1, which was read for us. Now God, now yet the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and so forth. So he was ordered to separate from his father's house and his kindred and implies that others of his family were resisting the command of God to separate themselves from their contemporaries and move over the Euphrates into the land that was indicated to them. <coughs> it should be rendered what we read here. Go for yourself, implying that it would be an advantage for Abraham to do so, irrespective of what the intentions of others were. And Genesis 12 goes on and says, If you do this, Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In Galatians 3 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul taught that in these promises, the gospel was preached to Abraham. Where he says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the nations through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, and thou shalt be a blessing. I'll make of thee a great nation, I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So the Apostle Paul was tell, is telling us that in these words, the gospel was preached. Ponder the words of the Apostle Paul. They're significant because if you fail to understand the promises made to Abraham, you fail to comprehend the saving truth of the gospel. And it shows the great importance of this subject. 
The Bible teaches that Christ came to confirm the promises made to Abraham. Romans 15, verse 8 and 9. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So it was Christ who came to confirm these promises and it was Christ who was the seed spoken of in the promises. And so that acceptance of the truth in them opens the way to eternal life by a resurrection from the dead. And the Apostle Peter tells us, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partaken, partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, it's through these precious promises, as he describes them then, that we can be partakers of that divine nature, of that resurrection to eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which, ye are, I, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You see, today we can test the validity of these promises and even watch them slowly coming to pass if we wish. And it's not something we're going to go into tonight. But if you care to look at the things of Scripture and see what the Bible tells us will occur, you can see that those things happening around us show that these promises are in fact being fulfilled. And that God is working to make these things happen. Well, the promise to Abraham was made up of a national promise where he said, I'll make thee a great nation. It was a personal promise. I'll bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. It was a communal promise. I'll bless them that bless thee. And finally, it's an international promise. All families. All nations of the earth will be blessed because of the promise that was made to Abraham, because of the gospel that was first preached to Abraham. But when you look at these promises, not one of them has been fulfilled. Abraham's descendants, Israel, are not great. Yes, they're a great nation as far as the world is concerned. They do great things, but not in God's terms. Abraham is dead. Very few bless him. And those who bless him are plagued with mortality. And I'd say also that through history, those who bless him have been plagued by those who do not understand the scripture. And all, all humanity today is in a state of curse rather than blessing. So what we owe it is to ourselves to understand, to search out these matters as Abraham did when instructed by God and to see that we can place complete trust in these promises. Promises are currently being vindicated. There's a national promise and the Jewish people, the people of Israel are descendants of Abraham. But in their, all their long and checkered history, they have never really answered to the promise made to Abraham. They have never attained to the elevation of a really great nation. For a few years under David and Solomon, they did. They attained to a measure of glory, but it was short-lived and terminated in civil war and division. And because of their constant wickedness, God repudiated the nation and it was scattered to all parts of the earth. And there the people of Israel remained, as we know they have, up until recently. And as the people, they were placed under great pressure by tyrants, endeavouring to annihilate them. But this was in vain, as God promised that they would one day become a great nation. God's word had been given. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. And though I make a full end of all nations, whither I scatter thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. And he's talking about the Jew, about Israel but I will correct thee in measure and not leave thee altogether unpunished. And God declared that he would restore them to their own land 
He says, in the latter days, ye shall consider it. The latter days, the days in which we live. And today, Israel's a nation. In 1948, they were re-established and the Jews continue to return there. Yes, things will occur to make them realise that God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that God is their God and the Lord Jesus Christ is their Saviour and King, which they don't acknowledge today. You see, the people were to be restored as a nation, as a people. The nation was going to be revived and ultimately there'd be a monarchy, as we have in Ezekiel 37. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. I will gather them on every side and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountain of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. Once again, it's a promise in the future. A promise of one king, the Lord Jesus Christ, reigning over the, the Jews, the king of the Jews. But not only the king of the Jews, but over the entire earth. In Jeremiah 33 and verse 17, we're told at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Uh, to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. And it's at that time when all nations will be blessed. You see, why does God do this for the Jew? Do this for one, as many would say, they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of their obedience? Certainly not. You look at the Jew today, and in general the ones there, I think there's more atheists there than, or so-called atheists, than those who believe in a God. But God does it for one reason. As he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So God made a promise to Abraham and God promised Abraham the world. And it's a basic, it is basic to an understanding of the purpose of God that this is re recognised. God has set it down in an unmistakable term. But we told there that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the Gentiles be coming, and until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming. So God has put a time on this here. There'll be a time when Israel will be fully restored under the Christ, their king. And they'll reach greatness and the glory of a nation that they have never experienced before. And the promise to Abraham will be fulfilled when they will be a great nation. Abraham will live to see it. For in declaring that he would make him a great nation, God promised to raise him from the dead to life eternal and to an everlasting inheritance upon the earth. The return of Christ and the complete restoration of Israel will pave the way for a new world order upon this earth that will bring the blessings of divine administration to all nations and all four aspects of the promise made to Abraham will be fulfilled. You see, the family of Abraham, as went down to Haran, is typical of man today. They heeded the command of God and motivated by the promise of him, Abraham hesitated no longer. And he left those of his relatives who would not act. He removed from Haran and passed over the Euphrates, entering into the land of Canaan, as Israel was then called. Before following him there, let's consider the four men who had heard the message of God and left Ur. We have Terah, whose name means to tarry or delay. He hesitated long and he died in Babylonia. <coughs> Nahor, whose name is a snorer. He was spiritually lethargic. He was not moved by the urgent need for salvation and never went into the land. 
We have Lot, whose name means veiled. And though he knew the promises of God, he ultimately strayed into Sodom. Though he'd crossed over, he succumbed to the worldly pressures. And Abraham, uh, Lot lost basically everything that he had. And Abraham, the man of faith, a man whose name signifies exalted father, crossed over the river in answer to the, what God told him to do. He gave his life completely to God and resolutely set himself to obey his commands. So Abraham became known as the Hebrew. Because he answered the call and crossed over the river Euphrates and entering into the promised land, the status of Abraham was changed. He became known as Abraham the Hebrew. <coughs> and the word Hebrew signifies one who has crossed over. It de denotes a man apart. And the Canaanites saw Abraham as a stranger in their midst. He was not one of them. He was a man from beyond the river, a man who crossed over from the way that leads to death to the way that opens to life. And the people among whom he now dealt had no reverence for God or his word. They were religious, but they, were, they followed false religion. And in their midst, Abraham dwelt as a stranger and a pilgrim. He was a stranger because he remained separate. And he was a pilgrim because he knew where he was going. He had objective in his life. He had something to live for, a great hope to stimulate him. He's called the father of the faithful. And by this is meant that he laid the foundation for what would follow. And in the Bible, it defines the community of faithful who walk in the steps of Abraham, endorsing his belief. The apostle Paul, when he spoke, he says, for this cause, therefore, I am called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. This was the hope that Abraham had, the hope of Israel. And it was this hope that the apostle Paul had. And having crossed from the way of death in the world for the way of life, they identified their faith and belief with that of Abraham. In Galatians 3, verse 8 and verse 29, we're told that the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And in verse 29, we're told that if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, God was work was going to work to draw out of the nations a people for his name all those who are Christ's are abraham's seed because god did visit the gentiles to take out of them a people for his name because abraham came out of a gentile nation and we told in second corinthians 6 verse 17 to 18 the 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 statement to us is, Wherefore come out from among them, and be, not se and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And this is a way to eternal life for us. It demands an element of sacrifice. But its rewards are commensurated a hundredfold and more, both now and in the age to come. We're not called upon to physically remove from the places of our sojourn, but socially, politically and religiously, we must, if we're to please God, act like Abraham did and cross over from the way leading to death to one leading to life that is acceptable to Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to God and the Lord Jesus Christ by submitting to baptism. You see, we have it in Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, where we're told, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. The example of Abraham constitutes a challenge to all who will answer the call of God. 
The challenge is to stand aside from the world of the ungodly as he did and consecrate their lives to God in the way appointed. So Abraham went into the promised land and in answer to the call of God, Abraham the Hebrew entered the land of promise and the narrative states that the Canaanite was in the land. It might seem unimportant. But the Canaanites were in a frightful and depraved, immoral people. And archaeology reveals what form of a religion they had and how immoral it was. They dominated the land socially and they polluted it as the world does today. For when Abraham, from this, Abraham had to keep completely separate. And true Christians today are required to do the same in regard to the present social, political and religious standing. We're in an age of great evil when viewed from God's point of view, in which standards of restraint are ridiculed, they're abandoned, and man does that which he wants. And such is the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ and also the prediction of the Bible. But for us, the way to wisdom is to follow in the footsteps of Abraham and in his stages of spiritual development. You see, Abraham was an idolater and worshipped false gods. He was attracted to the call of the true God. He became educated in the gospel. He separated from his prior way of life. He became a man of faith, motivated by the hope of the gospel. And in a similar fashion, we have to repudiate all that is antagonistic to God. We have to develop an understanding of God's word. We have to embrace the gospel, walk in the way of salvation, through baptism, continue in the ways that are pleasing to God and look and wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. And there are great benefits by doing that. Of, the, of Abraham it said that by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise. You see, he was a stranger who separated from his contemporaries, but a pilgrim, but he's classed as one of the faithful, who was in the land of promise. The objective was set before Abraham, the hope of the promise, and he lived in faith and in the anticipation of the resurrection from the dead, of the hope of the gospel. And it was the hope of the apostles the foundation upon which Christianity today, or true Christianity, is built, not Christianity today. The Apostle Paul believed. He says, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. The Apostle Paul looked for the resurrection from the dead. We've seen this. He These all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. In Daniel 2, we're told that many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And Abraham's one of those who is in the earth today who will be raised to everlasting life. All right, Thessalonians 4, verse 16, which I don't have on the screen. We're told, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise, rise first. And in Genesis 12, verse 2, as we read, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And the Lord Jesus Christ explained how this would be fulfilled in Luke 13, and verse 28, where he says, that they would see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. At this time, Abraham will no longer be a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth, but an honoured associate of the Lord Jesus Christ, inheriting the land promised him and reigning with Christ over the kingdom then established throughout the earth, when the Lord will be king over all the earth. In Psalm 10, verse 16 to 18, we're told that the Lord is king forever and ever, that the, the heathen are perished out of the land. 
Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. To judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. And such will be the changes that come on the earth in that day. You see, Abraham is to be the heir of the world. And during the course of the wanderings of Abraham and Lot, they covered the then known world. They left Ur of Chaldees in Babylon. They moved to Haran. They travelled south through Syria and Palestine, down through Egypt and back again to a place between Bethel and Ai. And there they worshipped God. But here, unfortunately, we find dissension broke out between the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot. And they separated. And Lot went to the well-watered plains of Jordan, the place of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he left Abraham, the pilgrim, in the land. And we find that where Lot went proved to be an illusion. And ultimately, his family succumbed to the way of the world around him. And Lot himself barely escaped with his life. But at this time, God made a further promise to Abraham, as was read for us in Genesis 13, verse 14 to 16, where we read, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and e southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. You see, it's not some shadowy promise on a cloud, strumming a harp, sipping, sipping coke, or whatever you may do up there. Abraham was told he would inherit the earth and the length of it forever. There's no immortal soul involved in this. Yes, Abraham's dead today. He's in the grave. He knows nothing, but he will be raised again. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 2 to 5, uh, Stephen actually, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2 to 5, and he said, Men and brethren and fathers, a God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Caran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land that I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Caran, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on Yet he promised that he would give it to him for his possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. So the statement of Stephen is very clear here, that God would give it to him. And Stephen spake that when Abraham was dead. And after the murder of Stephen, the Apostle Paul stood trial many years later, in Acts 26, verse 6 to 8, and he acknowledged the same thing. He says, I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come unto. He says, why should it be thought incredible with you that God should raise the dead? So it's by resurrection from the dead that eternal life will come to Abraham upon this earth. And this is consistent with the hope set forward in the Bible. In Isaiah 26, verse 19, it says, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. So it's showing that they will rise from the grave. In Psalm 71, verse 10 to 11, David promised, David prayed, Thou which hast showed me great and sore trouble shall quicken me again and shalt bring me again from the depths of the earth. You see, God, David knew that God was going to raise him from the dead. In Luke 14 and verse 14, And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, 
for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. You see, he was saying here that they would be raised. Abraham was a true Christian. Abraham is to be resurrected to inherit the earth. And this is what the Bible teaches. The revival of Israel today is God's guarantee of this fulfilment. Abraham was described as the heir of the world. As the Apostle Paul had in Romans 4, was not for the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the Lord, but through the righteousness of faith. A true Christian, therefore, is accounted a son of Abraham. As we, can, as we saw in Galatians 3, verse 29. Verse 26 to 29, we're told, For you are all the children of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, what I'm trying to show is that Abraham was given a promise, a promise of life on the earth. And it's only that promise of life on the earth that is a promise that will be that for any for mankind today. You see, he is not going to go to heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ stated that the meek shall inherit the earth. And the implications of this statement are quite incredible when you think about the world that is around us today. In Psalm 115, verse 16, we're told that the heaven, even the heaven, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. In Proverbs 11, verse 31, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. In Psalm 37, and it goes through here, they shall inherit the earth, the meek shall inherit the earth, they that be blessed shall inherit the earth, the righteous shall inherit the earth. And in Jeremiah 23, once again, a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice. In his days, Judah shall dwell safe and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name where he, by he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. It's but a few references that show that the promise for man is on the earth. And this is the hope of the gospel the good news of the glad tiding of the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom that will be established on this earth that will be reigned over by the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, through the gospel, with Abraham and Christ, it is possible to inherit the world if you're truly Christ's. Because we know that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And this is a kingdom that will not be left to other people, but it will break all the nations that are around us and become one kingdom ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham and his seed are not only promised the world, but they're promised it forever with honour and glory. They're told that they will reign with Christ in that kingdom that will be established. And throughout the Bible, God's revelation to man, he's clearly set forth his purpose to establish this upon the earth. In Daniel 7, just a few, the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And it's to be an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall obey him. Psalm 72, in his days shall the righteous flourish. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the end of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Isaiah 61, as the earth bringeth forth her blood and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. 
and we're given a warning for the nation that will not serve. That will not, the, the, king, the nation and kingdom that will not serve shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted. So the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of the gospel, will change the way of life on this earth. Men will learn to live in amity and goodwill towards each other. Because there will be glory to God in the highest, and on earth there will be peace and goodwill towards men. The, antag the antagonisms we see in the world today will pass. They won't be there anymore. Because there will be an infallible government of the Lord Jesus Christ who will reign over the earth. And in that day we're told that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's a glorious prospect, for the future is not to be pushed into the far distance. What we see happening in the world around us today says that this could occur or start to occur for those who understand the things of Almighty God any day. There's no doubt about this. You see, we have the choice. We can follow the things of Almighty God or we can follow ruin. But God's way presents a challenge to us, just as it did to Abraham. We can look towards the well-watered plains of, or we can stay at Bethel with Abraham. You see, Bethel signifies the house of God while Ai denotes rule. We can look towards the house of God or we can look towards rule. We can be as Lot, who was blinded by the attractions of Sodom, or we can be as Abraham, who looked in faith to the promise God had given him. You see, there's a challenge for us today. We can believe the things of Almighty God, we can understand them and live as God, as God requires. Or we can be as the beasts that perish, as Psalm 9 tells us. We can be in the, ha the house of God in Bethel. Or we can go to Ai, which is ruin. The house of God promises the world. It promises the earth for eternity. And that is what God will give. But it demands that men and women separate themselves from the ways of this world, that they understand the things of Almighty God, they understand the gospel and baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they continue in those ways as Abraham did. We thank you for your time, and we hope that you'll look at the things of the Scriptures and understand what God has left on record for us and the promise that he has for mankind upon this earth. Thank you. Thank you.